Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chat Channel. I'm Tim Hayden, and I'll be your host. Remember that you can ask questions while we're live. We have a super show for you today. Our guest is the multi-talented and the gorgeous Tanya Pinkins. Tanya is a Tony Obie drama desk, outer critic circle, and Lortel award-winning actor. She's a Broadway film and TV star who has starred in shows like As the World Turns, Gotham, Fear the Walking Dead, Red Pill, A Raisin in the Sun, and many more. But she is probably best known for her role as Livia Frackaday in the ABC's All My Children. Welcome to the show, Tanya. Hey, Tim. Thank you for having me. Excited. Thank you for thank you for being here. I'm just oh, you don't even know all of your work. I've seen not all of your work, but everything I have seen has been phenomenal. Hmm. Um, I feel fortunate to get to do what I do. Well, and you do it very well, very well. Um, what do you what uh what was it like for you growing up? Well, I grew up in Chicago. Um, on the south, well, I was born on the west side of Chicago and uh, raised on the south side of Chicago. And I am, I call myself a civil rights baby because um, when I went to school, there was a big push in America for integration. So from the time I was in first grade, my classes were completely integrated. So that is my world. You know, people often ask me about my movie Red Pill. Like, how did all those people in that movie know each other? I'm like, that's what my world looks like from the time I'm six years old. I have had a very inclusive, diverse group of friends. So uh, that's how I see the world. And I, I went to um, a magnet school, which also had this integration principal, Whitney Young, with the then Michelle Robinson, who it became yes. Michelle Obama. And wow. started working professionally when I was about 12 or 13 doing commercials and industrial films because a lot of big companies were in Chicago. Yes. So, um, and then did my first professional play at the Goodman Theater when I was 16. Wow. Wow. I, I know you've done a lot of theater. Uh, do you have any siblings? I have half siblings. So I have three half brothers and one half sister. Oh, are any of them into acting or? <laughs> nope. Nope. I'm the only so, person in my family in show business. Well, you're, you're fabulous. When did you know or think acting was what you wanted to do? Was there a particular you know, point? Honestly, I never thought that would be what I would do. Uh, always kind of shy, liked to create things, but didn't particularly want people watching me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I like to be alone in my room. My mother used to say, it's no punishment for you to tell you you can't go outside. You're much happier in your room alone. <laughs> um, I think by the time I got to Caroline or Change, which was 2004, I went, oh, I, I think maybe I'm an actor and that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but 2004. <I> think <laughs> oh, come on. We've done that for much longer than you did then, for sure. <laughs> but I've always been trying to run away from it because I like so many things. I'm just so curious about the world and about life that there's always something else. I'm like, oh, well, let's try that. Oh, well, let's try that. So I'm not, you know, like most actors who are like, you know, waiting for the next job because they so want the next job. I'm like, yeah, I'm not waiting for anything because there's too many other interesting things in the world that I could be doing. <laughs> Well, I mean, we'll get to it, but Red Pill is a perfect example of that. Um, so you went, you attended some fabulous schools. I mean, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, Columbia College in Chicago, and California Western School of Law. Yes. Did you, did. Did you, did you take law at that school? or? Oh, yes. It was a two-year law school program, and um, I left because I was in a, got a Broadway show. And I realized in my first year in law school that I, the things I wanted to do in the law, being a lawyer would actually uh, impede me trying to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. So I have a kind of knack for that material and it allowed me to work and you know, create with some friends, our own nonprofit and to called Operation Z and to do um, 
work for people, particularly people who can't afford lawyers to advise them, to direct them uh, on how to write their own papers. And I'm very passionate. I like have this uh, bone about injustice. You know, if I see an injustice, I'm like a dog with a bone. I got to just. Yes. Yes. And, and you do a lot of advocacy work, too. I mean, uh, not to mention the the organizations that you've helped and you can you still help. You're still part of um, well, I guess I'm going to jump to you won the Tony Award for Best Performance by a Featured Actress in a Musical in 1992 in Jelly's Last Jam. What was that like? I mean, a Tony, my goodness. Something I had dreamed of as a kid. So, you know, really like that, a dream coming true. Like you remember, I remembered being a little kid and imagining what that would be like. And um, it was predicted that I wouldn't win. I certainly, nobody knew who I was. I hadn't really done anything before. And so it was really like that dreams can come true moment. Right. Did, uh, I that wish I could. Because that was a show I watched as a kid too. And to get to suddenly be on something that I dreamed of, you know, yeah. Well, before even before you got to all my children, I believe you were on As the World Turns. Yes, indeed. Do you remember what that audition was like? You know, this is a this may sound very strange about me. Um, whenever I would go to auditions, I'd always be helping other people with their audition. <laughs> and so I remember I auditioned for a number of soaps during that time. Everybody was bringing on a, a black, a young black person. And so I, I, I just remember that I was coaching somebody else at that audition. I think I had to sing at the audition. And that was kind of just my way. Um, I, you know, I always kind of believe that what's yours is yours and nobody's going to take it from you. It's your fate. So, um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure everybody's aware that you do sing, and if you all ha aren't, you need to find it because you have a phenomenal voice. Thank you. I mean, phenomenal. I've been listening to your YouTube songs all morning long. Oh, thank it's, you. It's just so beautiful. Thank you. Um, do you remember what your first day was like on the set? I don't. I don't. I think then Eddie Earl Hatch was my to be love interest. Um, yes. The My high school friends were uh, Betsy. And uh, so it was Julianne Moore, uh, Stephen Weber, Marissa Tomei. And gosh, why can't I remember Betsy's name? You know who Betsy is. Come on, come on, come uh, on. Of course, she's my favorite actress. I know. I would it not till you put me on the spot. Um, I know. It's fell in a senior moment. Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan and Meg Ryan. So uh, it oh was God. the kids. The kids. Couldn't think of her name. I know, I know. Same for me. I'm Sorry, like, Meg. Face. I know I'm trying to get you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, it was great. You know, the super talented people, and you know the kids, the kids in the community. And my dad was Earl Hyman, the late Earl Hyman, who was a very strict father. I'm not sure about the date. Did were you working with uh, 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 Scott Bryce too? Was he on the show yet? Patty Bryce was on the show. Yeah, he was, he's, he's a good friend of our show. He yeah, was yeah, and he was a bad stuff. boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but he was, a, they took his character and turned it around. We talked about that on his show, how that was one of the few times that Daytime did that, was able yeah. to successfully do that. Yes. So, what was All My Children like? Oh, my goodness. Well, as I said, I watched that show from the very first day. I think Chicago was a number one uh, all my children's city in the country at the time. And so I'd watched that since I was about seven years old, grew up dreaming of ever getting to be on a soap opera. Like that was the dream. And when I came to town, I, I auditioned for five or six of them. And I was actually going to screen test for one. And I had booked another job and I just knew I was going to get it. And so I just turned down the other job because I knew I was going to get it. And the day of the screen test came and they called and said, oh, we're canceling the screen test because there was an offer out that was accepted by Debbie Morgan to play Angie. And I was like, oh, oh no. there went my shot. But the wonderful thing about it is that Joan Dincheco, rest her soul, was this extraordinary casting director who cast all of our favorites on All My Children. 
And I guess it would have been about 10 or 15 years later when they were casting for Livia, I was out in LA doing Jelly Slash Jam at the Mark Taper Forum. And a friend of mine, Cynthia Martels, said she was about to screen test for this new role on All My Children. And I was like, hey, I didn't even know about the audition. They were already at the screen test. And I called my agent and I said, can you just call and see if there's any way I can get in? And Joan Dincheco remembered me. Wow. And so she let me come straight to a screen test for the role. Well, I mean, I can't imagine anybody else playing that role. I mean, that did you know that she was going, Livia was going to become at one point almost a primary. No, I didn't know anything. I mean, they said that she, she had tested very well and, you know, she had her lovely love triangle and Michael B. Jordan was on there with me and Dondre Whitfield and Richard Lawson and Dick Schoberg. It was a really talented group of people. And, and cause when I was telling us, when I told people that you were going to be on my show, that was, they were like, oh, that's Livia. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I know you as another character. Well, I know you as that, but I know you best as another character. I get to. What character is that? Oh, you'll know in a moment. Okay. Uh, wait, was that your last soap opera, though, All My Children? Yes. That's the last time I was on a soap opera. And I was on there on and off for about 10 years um, till it went off the air. Would you go back to a soap that they... I it, think so. It could be or, fun. Or, it could be fun. I think you'd be very good on Young and the Restless. Oh, okay. <laughs> they need to, yes. I, I, I watch, still watch soaps that are on, but I see you fitting in a couple of places in Young okay. and the Restless. For sure. So uh, I'm going on to your prime time now. You've been in many shows, guest star and starring in shows... Cosby Show, Criminal Minds, 24, Scandal. But I had to talk my favorite one. My favorite one was when you were Nurse Ethel Peabody on Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> Love Nurse Peabody. That was one of my favorites, too. <laughs> what was it like getting to play a villain? That had to be fun. The best. First of all. Um, Plus you're with B.D. Wong. Come on. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> I was only cast for four episodes. And BD is a theater actor and I'm a theater actor. And we both, you know, he was, you know, cast for the whole season. And, you know, when we got there and he was like, oh, we're going to do this all season. And I'm like, BD, I'm not, I'm not cast for the whole season. I'm just here for, you know, four episodes with you. And he's like, oh, we'll change that. And so BD and I started, um, you know, making these little things that we would do together, the way we would walk together, the way we would exit frame together. We started building a relationship with one another and the writers started writing to it. And I ended up getting about 11 episodes. Well, if my memory serves, you, was, you were on longer than he was. His I don't know if that's true. I don't I know. Because I remember they brought Mars Peabody back at one point for a couple of episodes. I was like, oh, yes. For yeah, and I was with um with Jada Pinkett Smith, who was playing yes. Fit, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean that entire cast of that show. I mean, I could talk about the show all day because what was it like to pierce the veil of DC? I mean, that's DC Marvel. That's crazy really? to get on those, and you did. Yeah, yeah. I love playing with Robin Lord Taylor. Oh, we had so so much fun <laughs> together. Uh, I think that that was like my first villain. And now I'm like, that's all I ever want to be. <laughs> well, this That's leading me to <laughs> the next villain <laughs> that I'm sure uh, a lot of fans are familiar with. Fear the Walking Dead. Did you know that your character, Martha, was rated the worst Walking Dead villain ever? Really? Tell me more. Yes, that, I'll have to get the article, but yes. When I read that, I was like, oh, my gosh, I wonder if she knows that. Yes, you know, there's an article that said it. Uh, I mean, do you hold the title with pride now? I will, absolutely. I mean, because <laughs> I mean, you had some pretty bad guys on that show. People, characters, not just guys, characters on that show. so nice. She would kill you for bad grammar. <laughs> yes, yes, and and yeah. And it, yeah, what did you think of that character? I mean, getting to play that character. First of all, the audition material was fantastic. Um, I actually posted my audition for Walk, Fear of the Walking Dead on YouTube. 
Uh, those producers used to write material for people who were auditioning. So you wouldn't be auditioning with material from the show, like a script. They wrote scenes so that the actors could really have something to work with. And it was this wonderful monologue where a woman is calling someone to return their dog. And, um, you know, the woman shows up so excited to have found her dog and she wants to check her ID to make sure she's the one. And then she says, Isn't, aren't you a, a, an ambulance nurse or something like that? And the woman's like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, I, I remember speaking to you during that storm and my husband was crushed under a building and, and, uh, and you said, don't worry, you were coming. And by the time you got there, he was dead and my life fell to pieces. So here's your dog in pieces. <laughs> I love that you can remember that. Because oh, it was a great monologue. <laughs> that was, that was, I mean, that character, uh, I loved how you used the zombies. You, you, and you cut your own arm off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. She became a true believer that zombies were the future. Yeah. Kind of like some people believe transhumanism is the future. Yeah. And it may well be. It may well be. For sure. I mean, I mean, who knows? Who knows? For real. Uh, well, you went on to play in a big film. Well, you didn't go. This is going back. Sorry, I'm going backwards. In many films. What was it like to be in See No Evil, Hear No Evil with two of the funniest men ever, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder? <laughs> Richard Pryor is my favorite comedian of all time. And so getting to just spend a day chit-chatting with him was, you know, I, I can't even describe it. Like you kind of are speechless because you're in the presence of someone who... Um, is a genius and sort of a god of that world. And he was just such a regular guy, really just so easy and regular. I've been fortunate to have worked with a number of very famous people who were just regular. Tupac Shakur um, on Above That's, the Rim, you know, spending the day with him. Just was, regular. I mean, how did, first off, Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor together. Anytime you heard them together, you knew it was going to be gold. You, I mean, you just knew it. How did you keep a straight face on the set when you were, I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, that's what we get trained to do. It's that public solitude. Um, yeah, that's just, that's just part of the training. That's correct. I, I know uh, one celebrity said that she would put a tack in her shoe. She would put a tack in her shoe because she, to keep it together. Well, actually, it was Carol. It was Carol Burnett who said it <laughs> on her well, show. She was oh, she, she was hasn't joking. been on my show. No, she <laughs> said that it was an interview they did with her, and she said that when uh, being on the stage with Tim Conway and Harvey Corman, that she could because that was live. <laughs> so she had to to keep a straight face. and sometimes have to put down on that thumbtack on her heel. Like, that that's is dedication. <laughs> Whoa. Well, I'm going on to the big one. Okay. And if, not, if anybody has not seen it, you are sorely missing out. You wrote, directed, and starred in Red Pill. I'll let you tell everybody what what it's about. Uh, you can explain probably better than I can. So, um, as we were, you know, getting ready for the 2020, the 2016, the elections, the presidential elections, I think that the what was clear to me is how divided our country was. And I didn't really personally see any good guys in that divide. It was like, okay, you know, I don't see that either side is going to really bring equality to the world. But everybody who was for their sides was really, and whatever, whenever I would talk about what I thought, people just treated me with kind of contempt. And so I thought, well, I feel so intensely about this. Can I make a movie that shows um, that sort of balance of shadow in both sides? And I was like, you know, you got the talkers and the doers. And and so that was um, what Red Pill is. It's a group of people who are going to canvas in Virginia and for the 2020 election. And uh, 
they get many signs that this is not a good thing to do, <laughs> but they're going to do something. And my character is like, yeah, it's going to work. I think you should go back. And they don't. And it kind of doesn't work out for them. <laughs> well, I've got some more questions, but sure. I will say during the process, and I think it was right when you got to the house, when y'all first arrived at the house, just the feeling, it made me think of something. What? And it, it, it's been in my head since. I cannot but imagine being an African-American person going into a small town that you do not know anybody at. Mm. I cannot, that, that is what came to my mind when you were there at the house saying, I, I got a bad feeling or something. I was just like, oh man, I can't even imagine. Cannot fathom. It's very real. It is very, it is. very real. Very real. I mean, I actually had that just the other day in Brooklyn. I was going to someone's house at night that I did not know. And I thought I had the number right, but I had inverted a number and I go and I knock on this door and this young white kid comes to the door and I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen to me now? <laughs> it's fine. You know, he was like, no, that person doesn't live here. And then I had to go and check that I had inverted the numbers. But yeah, that's a real, that's a real, that's a real concern in these well, days. That's just one, like I said, watching this movie, it's going to make everybody think about all different kinds of things. And we'll talk about a little bit more, but that was my first thought of that. Uh, not about the movie, but watching. No, the movie. Many people said that to me that uh, many of my white friends were like, they had not ever m imagined that it was scary for black people to go into a white neighborhood, but that is very real. I am 50 years old and I've got African American family, but until that moment in 50 years, I had never put, thought about that. Mm, yeah, that's a real thing. And, and it sure is. Uh, it's so it's a controversial movie. Did you worry about any blowback due to some I was hoping for blowback. I was hoping for blowback. I was hoping that a conversation could get started about it because I think that that's what we need. We need to have conversations with each other, <laughs> you know. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I knew that I was, um, you know, I felt like I was pushing buttons on both sides, you know, insulting everybody. Yes. And that was what I wanted to do, to say, there's no good, there's no good, there's no good side here. <laughs> right. And you know, I want to tell everybody, I know we're talking about it being political. Po the politics is just a part of the movie. There's, it's actually it's a, good, a horror film. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great horror movie, thriller, drama that, you know, the, like I said, the politics, don't let that stop you from watching it because it's such a phenomenal show. And I did not dare see that end coming. Mm. I'm not going to ruin it for anybody, but I, I hadn't, that just blew my mind. And I, I am a horror movie fan. Love, that's like my favorite genre. And that one you have to trade horror movies suggestions. Oh, for sure. I, I, Pinhead's like my number one. Okay, you know, there's a new one. Yes, I'd watch it as soon as it came out with uh Jamie Clayton. Yeah, that girl the was getting on nerves. I was like, killer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the original is Brad uh uh Doug Bradley. But anyway, that's a different movie. I want to talk about yours. But everybody needs to rent or buy this movie. You can find it on Amazon and it's i'm telling you you're gonna like it a lot so what do you do during your free time if you have any um uh, i write i'm adapting uh some some like urban fantasy books into a potential uh limited series um i'm trying to raise money for some other films i want to make I paint, um, I bike, I hike, uh, I read a lot. Um, your kids, you've got a few kids, don't you? Adult kids, uh, uh, adult right. kids. They're all grown. The yes. youngest is 23, 23 to 35. Did any of them show any interest in acting? My son, my oldest son, has done some acting. He's been in some movies and plays. My daughter is an amazing singer, but I don't know if they'll do it. You know, I feel like this generation, with all of the new psychological things we've learned about trauma and all of that, um, are a little too soft for this business. Because this business is tough. 
it is rejection and you got people talking about you, what you look like right in front of you and, oh, your nose and you didn't <laughs> like, right. you got to really have some tough skin to be in this business. Um, a lot of, some of the other guests that I've had on said, you know, if I, if you don't really, really, really want to be an actor, find something else. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. What happened during COVID? How did that affect you and your acting and stuff? Did that just give you more time to write? COVID was lovely for me. And I realized how, um, just how, much I like, I'm an introvert. So it was this time to regain all this energy that I had been expending in the world and to bring it all back to me. And I, I really appreciated the solitude of it. I spent a couple of months in Korea. That's where I edited Red Pill. Um, nice. I spent a couple of months in Panama. I spent, I went to Egypt and Sudan. I went to Kentucky, I told you. Uh, so I love to travel. I love being in a foreign place where I don't know anything and just like everything is new and I'm learning. And so it was a good time for me. Did, uh, what do you think about the way they've converted now to auditioning? You know, it's so disappointing because some of the, you know, I'm one of those people that I'm from the Midwest. And one of my favorite things about uh, the Midwest is like you could just drop in somebody's house. You could just go by and knock on the door, and it was like, oh my god, your day could suddenly be made by a drop-in right. visitor. That is so not the way it is in the east. Um, and um, going to auditions was a was a social event. You run into somebody, and then suddenly you're going to have lunch with them, or you're walking down the street. And so I I truly miss in-person auditions. I, I was at a memorial the other day for an actor friend. And that was like, oh my God, we were all so glad to see each other because we hadn't seen each other in years and we don't have occasion to see each other with self-taping. Right. And, and plus you're a, a theater lady. You like to feel. You like to feel. Yes. Um, so is there anything that anyone that you think that let me rephrase that. Is there any question that you wish that an interviewer had asked? Because I know as an interviewer, it's hard to come up with que unique questions. Um, I don't I don't know how anyone would ask this question because people don't know what they don't know. But I wish people understood. And if they understood or considered this, then this question would come up more. Um, like, how do you craft your characters? I think often um, people don't think of what we do as actors as a craft. And I think of it as a craft. So it's not like I, I am every character I am, but I'm making decisions and they're intentional decisions. And I think oftentimes with the acting profession, people don't consider that the way we behave was a choice um, and that we're trying to communicate something. You may just go, I just don't like it and go, okay, you don't like it, but why did that actor choose to do it that way? Um, I wish people, you know, asked more about like, well, I didn't like when you did blah, 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 blah. Why did you choose that? And you might find out, well, that was a moment where you're supposed to not like the character because then I want to win you back three scenes right. later. <laughs> right. So are you, are you, do you remember your characters? Like if they asked you to be live again on uh, general hospital, could you just pick up that role again or would you have to? No, I think I could just pick it up. Uh, Cause I know uh, I talked to Tanya Walker yesterday. She's like, I could pick it up. She said each character has a different spot, you know, oh. she could pick them, pick them right back out if she had to. I don't, yeah. I don't think you have a different spot, but um, I definitely think I could do it because they all are me. <laughs> right. Well, I'm hoping, really hoping that DC under their new management will bring you back in some oh, way, shape, or form because nobody else could play that role. Thanks. Nobody else I could love play that, that role. role. 
I love <laughs> Ethel. The smile all the time. The glasses and the smile. <laughs> and the purple lips and the black yes. and white nails. Yes, I love it. I'm so happy you were here, Tanya. I hope you'll come back. Oh, please have me back. Thank you so much, Tim. Because I, I, I could ask you so much more, but you know, I've already taken up time that you need to be writing. Because I want, oh, yeah. I'm hoping there's going to be a little, maybe a sequel to Red Pill. Because the way it ended, there is a possibility. <laughs> well, I have some other movie projects that, uh, that one I was telling you about when I came to Kentucky for that family reunion. It's a, a true story of three generations in Kentucky. So that is uh, what I hope to get called Freedom Code about the uh, quote underground railroad in Ken that Kentucky was at the center of. Well, I hope if you come to Kentucky, you let me know. I I'll would. come out there and meet you. All right. If you so hang on backstage, I could be back there in just a couple of minutes. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. I'd like to thank our guest, Tanya Pinkins, for being here today. I would like to thank the Necrotizing Fasciitis Foundation for sponsoring our show. For more information on necrotizing fasciitis, visit www.necfasci.org. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great upcoming episodes. And remember, as usual, please be kind to one another. Have a great day.